Welcome to the audio fiction podcast, The History Singer, written, produced, and voiced by me, your host, Jan Nichols. You should know that the story is told in sequential order, so start with 101 and carry on. Also, The History Singer is written in changing first-person narrative. From time to time, you'll hear me say a character's name. That's your cue that the following section is from that person's perspective. And now, our story begins. There was so much blood, not that I could see it very well. My vision was fuzzy and unfocused. I rolled to my left side, trying to sit up. Not a good idea. That's when my stomach heaved expelling every bite of food I'd ever eaten. Of course, that isn't possible, but that's what it felt like. I've been told I tend to exaggerate. Stubbly grass imprinted my cheek as I lay, all curled up. While my belly clenched and spewed, I watched the pool of blood inch closer. Like I said, there was too much blood on the ground, not enough inside my body where it belonged. That's when my head shattered. It felt the way those colored glass beads looked when I dropped them on the uneven cobblestones at the Vrenholm Bazaar. I kept the broken shards anyway. The sparkly colors grew brighter and brighter. Then they vanished. Just before everything went dark, I murmured, Did I really sing for a dead man? Ariante, earlier that day. I held on to sleep, wanting to see if some new detail of the dream lingered. It had come to me ever since I was old enough to remember, but it was gone with the morning light that filtered through the wagon's canvas walls. Not exactly canvas. The material had nanotech inlays, impervious to heat and cold or rain. The important thing was that it looked like canvas, You never knew when the scalded bane anti-tech zealots might turn up. The name meant the scalded hand in the common commerce tongue, known as Com. With a name like that, you'd think their members would be few. But Elifus, my heart father, said there were thousands of them, mostly in Renatus, the capital city. He never said so, but I knew Elifus avoided Renatus. I just didn't know why. Reaching for my journal, an extravagant gift from Elifus and Soba, my heart mother, I turned the flecked pages, reminders of its past life as a plant. The ivory paper was bound within a deep crimson calfskin cover. I wrote down what I remembered of the dream. It wasn't difficult. The dream never changed. Nothing new was ever revealed, and no familiar detail was ever omitted. I traced the familiar words with my index finger. My letters had improved in the ten years since Elifus had gifted me the journal. He had purchased it from a trader headed to Renatus, capital city of Nerth, paper being the lifeblood of the city's administration. Ariante, are you going to scribble in that bound book all morning? It was a good nature scold coming from Soba. Coming! I yelled, pulling on yesterday's nearly clean leggings. I found a fresh undershirt in the drawer below my bunk and topped it with a long-sleeved muslin overshirt that ended just above my knees. A faded patchwork overvest followed, remade from its previous life as a quilt. Giving my boots a couple of hard shakes, I peered inside to make sure that any scorpions who had spent the night there were gone. After a hasty finger comb of my hair, I jumped over the wagon steps to plop down on the Artosi braided cushion next to Soba. I 
I don't mean to harp on you, Soba said, but I worry that you spend too much time alone. Alone? The word exploded out of my mouth. I'm hardly ever alone. Soba handed me a wooden bowl of thick oat porridge and a carved wooden spoon. I used it to stab the air as I made my point that I never had a moment's solitude. At first light, I'm up to gather firewood with Toby. Though I don't understand why we don't use the tech oven for cooking, I know why we can't use it because tech is forbidden outside Renatus, but I don't understand why it matters when we're miles away from the nearest holding. I paused for breath and another bite of porridge. Anyway, after we eat, my lessons begin. First it's letters, history, and voice with the lifus. Next, Lotus and Luna instruct me in dance and stagecraft. And then there's music practice with the little men. We break for the midday meal and it starts all over again. And that's just the days when we're not performing. Soba's faded blue eyes smiled, having heard this lament before. Stop waving that spoon, girl, and use some to put food in your mouth. If you keep shooting upward without adding a little flesh, you'll soon look like a sharp corner without a shadow. Obliging, with a spoonful that made my cheeks bulge, I looked around, noticing that it was uncommonly quiet. The camp was always a hubbub of music and voices, wagons creaking and groaning as their loads were lifted on and off. Where is everyone? I asked around another mouthful. Cinnamon made my tongue tingle. A rare treat, as spices were hard to come by. Soba shrugged, scraping the last of the porridge into a ceramic pot. Thin crack lines etched the spidery design across its surface. Elifus left early, in search of a new wheel for the supply wagon, Soba said. She dried her hands on a camp towel and draped it over a hook on the wagon box. He'll be back from River's End Holding before sunset. Let me guess, I interrupted, talking around another mouthful of porridge. All of the little men are seeing how quickly they can reach the bottom of that barrel of hard cider you were gifted for helping birth the brewer's twins. It's true, Soba said, rolling her eyes. I do not understand how the brothers, so small in stature, can outdrink our strong man Demos. While he feeds the horses, Demos is close at hand to keep anyone from drowning. Soba pulled a bag of amaranth flour from the supply wagon. Last I saw, Lotus and Luna were mending costumes, and your guess is as good as mine on the whereabouts of Toby. The almost imperceptible snap of a branch stopped me in mid-bite. Then a knife struck the ground, pinning the hem of my overshirt. Toby, you'd better hope you haven't torn... Without finishing the sentence, I hurled the wooden spoon, sending it end over end to deposit a sizable serving of oat porridge in Toby's right eye. He laughed silently, shoulders shaking. Swiping the porridge away with his index finger, Toby popped it into his mouth. He sat next to me on the cushion with a fluid movement. Striking viper fast, Soba gave Toby's knuckles a not insignificant rap with the long handle of a cauldron ladle. What have I told you, imp? She threatened another whack, but softened. Save the knife throwing for the stage, or for hunting, she said. My fingers flew like hummingbird wings, forming words in the dancing hands language that was Toby's speech. You're an idiot, even if you are the best knife handler on earth, I said aloud as I sighed. Toby's fingers danced in return, and you are a sour persimmon without beauty, talent, or grace. I let my eyes defocus and cross while sticking out my tongue. Toby pulled his index fingers up each nostril and used his thumbs to turn his lower lip inside out. Soba chuckled, dusting flour off her hands. If you're going to behave like unschooled jackanapes, do it out of my sight. She pointed at a wooden neck yoke and two large buckets, their metal bands red with rust. Fetch some water and don't be scooping it up from the bottom of the river this time. Turning to me, Soba pointed to a tightly woven Artosi braid basket. There are no lessons today. You may pick berries if there are any left in that patch you found the other day, and be back well before sundown. The scalded bane may have patrols in these woods, and I've heard... Well, never mind what I've heard. Just be gone about your business and be back before shadow time. Shadow time was the calm translation of an Artosi word for late day before twilight. 
I thought about pressing Soba to find out exactly what she had heard, but the Artozi born were stubborn, and Soba could be as silent as the roots of the grassland that was her birthplace. Toby and I raced to the outer edge of the camp, past the horse's tether line, our fingers laughing together, never touching. So, little nightingale, are you on track to be the best history singer on earth? Toby sighed. I shook my head, strands of my unruly auburn hair twirling around my face, since I'm the only apprentice singer on earth. Toby brushed my hand to interrupt. The only apprentice history singer we know of, he said. Yes, I shrugged and sighed. But even if there isn't another, it Elifus says I have many more years of study before I'm ready to sing the honored histories. Pretending indifference, I crouched before a scraggly patch of blackberries and began picking. Ow! Toby yelled. I couldn't make out the sound, but I thought he was mangling curse words. New vocabulary? I asked in my most innocent voice. Mind the thorns, he sighed, rubbing blood off the back of his hand onto the newly green grass. Toby started picking the blackberries again, as he was very partial to Soba's pies. You've been training every day of your life, he asked. Why is it such a big deal? Rising majestically to my full height, I signed something along the lines of, Shut up, oaf, and bow before the first female history singer since ancient days. I apologize, your most importantness, Toby said. I am honored to be in your presence. He took a deep breath, then signed lightning fast. Unless you caterwaller like one of those sea creatures you're always going on about. They were called Cetaceans, I said, adding dimwit afterward to make my point. Assured by his grimace that Toby was reading my lips, I continued. They were noble giants who danced and sang in the once-was sea. The morning light softened as a cloud scurried across the sky. I stood there, imagining the long ago before time. They sang, Toby. They sang songs that carried miles and miles to others of their kind. Those who heard the song sang it back, each adding their own voice to it. I swayed to the rhythm of a lost song, washed along by invisible waves. I wish I could have heard them. I wish I knew what their song sounded like and what they meant. Then I dropped to my knees, feeling pale and hollow-eyed. Oh, Toby, don't tell anyone, but I am afraid. What if I profane the sacred text by forgetting the words? And then I thought of the worst thing imaginable. What if I disappointed Lyphus? Toby knelt beside me, brown hair spilling over delicate brows. I'm sorry, Arya. He leaned in so close our foreheads touched, resting one hand on my shoulder to sign. I was only teasing. I've never seen you afraid of anything, and you never forget a song. Emotions fluttered across his face, clouds, sunlight, and shadow in rapid succession. Toby's fingers caressed my shoulder, a fluttering murmur. You could never disappoint anyone. Not me, and certainly not Eliphas. I took his other hand in mine and brought it to my cheek. He lingered a moment, soft breath stirring the hair that framed my face. I could tell he wanted to kiss me. I leaned toward him and rested my cheek against his faintly stubbled one. It was lovely until I turned my head and brushed his lips with the ghost of a kiss. Two blotchy spots of red flared on Toby's cheeks, as he thrust me back and stood in one graceful movement. It was as if I was a flame and had burned him. I'd better get that water, he signed. He picked up the yoke and buckets and disappeared. After listening a while, I began to sing. It was a game I played, imitating the birds until a melody emerged from the trilling and repetitive calls. 
and life has taught me that the birds gave no thought that they were singing. There was only the song, and the birds sang it. They were the song. I thought of how Eliphas would stand, one foot resting on a tree stump as he schooled me to be a history singer. He would say the most contrary things. The song has always been there, he would say. You are merely encountering it again. It is the act of singular things, combining, coming together, and coming apart that makes singing an art, and nature the greatest artist of all. A faint scent of almond tickled my nose, coming from a patch of twin flower with its whitish pink petals. I imagined what it would be like to sing before the great lords of Nerth, to stand alone, dressed in the traditional velvet robes. I stood up as if to perform. My heart pounded against my ribs, but I eventually breathed my way to a kind of calm. With closed eyes, I began the song of Icarus, chanting the opening canto that introduced Daedalus, the labyrinth builder, and his son, who wanted to touch the fiery orb. At first, I thought it was the brush of insect wings against my ear until a voice whispered, keep singing if you want to live. Startled, I opened my eyes and fell silent. Senses reeling, I smelled death, the sweet, rotten odor of flesh falling from the bone. I had grown up with stories of the decomps, victims of the great plague that was the end of the before time. From the few surviving accounts, billions had died, but not all of them stayed dead. Until this moment, I had thought the stories about the decomps were made up to scare children into behaving. But there it was, a young man, I think, or what was left of one, standing in the brushy undergrowth less than ten strides away. Xanderin Bikanyi. I was in a foul mood. Even so, it was good to be out of the city, away from the stink and the stinking politics of Renatus. A city built in the long, slow tick of time. Twenty centuries since our planetary migration and the beginning of the aftertime. You'd think we'd have better plumbing by now. Xanthes tossed his head at the sound of my voice. A smile lurked at the corners of my mouth. My sole companion on this God's cursed assignment was also my best friend, Xanthes. A stallion out of the Carthusian mine, Xanthes had an impressive lineage. His ancestors carried knights into battle in the long ago time. He was big at seventeen hands and strong, but compact, elegant, and smart. He was royal and fit for royalty, and his rider was fit for what? Envoy and messenger on this assignment, less civilized things on other occasions. The sun dropped from its zenith. I would be at the encampment in less than an hour. Odd how measures of time from before were still in use. Xanthes and I turned off the rutted excuse for a road and headed toward the sound of rushing water. After drinking our fill, I sat, legs outstretched, my back resting against the smooth bark of a poplar. Xanthes snuffled at the grass, choosing choice greens by a reckoning beyond my understanding. The gods only know why Sebastian, Archon of the Scalded Bane, assigned me, ordered actually, to find and travel with the ladies' players. It meant that I would see Eliphas again. Our parting had not been civil. 
Delaying the inevitable, I enjoyed the rustle and sway of the poplar leaves until the sound of a woman's voice intruded. She was singing a lullaby, a song I knew without knowing how I knew. Xanthes, to me, I called. Ears upright, the reins of his hackamore dragging the ground, Xanthes heard it too. I swung up on his back with the ease of long practice. Without taking time to saddle up or collect our gear, we followed the voice. I let Xanthes pick his way through the brush, changing direction as the wind muted and then amplified the sound. We found her just shy of a half hour. She was standing in a clearing, and our toesy braided basket at her feet, and she was singing to a dead man. I really hope that you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I have a small ask. Please leave a rating and review to help other people find the show. To make it easy, just use this link, regardless of your podcast listening platform. Go to followthepodcast.com. That's it. Thank you for listening. You know, I thought I made this podcast for me because I felt compelled to tell this story. Now, I realize I really made it for you.